the wee Bible study that we've been working through uh, the Little War and Weir's Me book. And uh, we're this week into chapter 8, which is looking at the sword of the Spirit. And we've had just some great uh, study times together. And so if you're free, Wednesday night at half seven, we'll just make a big circle here at uh, the front of the church and everybody's uh, very safe and distance apart and everything. And again, just joining us for that study if you're free. September time, September for a bundle of months, we're looking at this little book called Love Your Church. And it's a, it's a super book. I've just kind of glanced through bits of it so far. And again, just with the impact of COVID and the change that it's made to church life, the thought is just in September through for a few months, just to study and look together at what it means to be church. And on Sunday morning, we'll go through uh, each chapter, kind of take the biblical premise for each chapter, which are belonging, welcoming, gathering, caring, serving, honoring, witnessing, and sending. And we'll just jump into each of those on Sunday mornings. And then at the midweek, at the Bible study together, we will pick up the chapters and just dig a wee bit further into it. So I, can I just encourage you so, so much, please. If you see Karen, buy a book, uh, five euro, and the more we buy, we can get them at a good rate, um, but we're paying in sterling, so we're just selling at five euro um, for the book. And, and it means you can be reading at home, thinking at home, and then on Wednesdays and on Sundays, we'll just be able to dig a wee bit deeper into what it means to be church and how we be church and how we play our part as church. So even if you haven't been coming to midweek, can I encourage you, please, buy a book, make a commitment, even for that period of time, just as to what it is to be church and to do church and to live church with Christ living in us. So I really encourage you uh, towards that, please. Also, just to let you know, at the end of church time this morning, um, We'll pronounce the benediction, we will finish the service and again feeling free to go home. But for those that wish to, we're going to stay in the building or come back. Maybe you need to go out and get a bit fresh air and then come back in again. Um, but to come back into the building just for a short time of prayer, but personal prayer. Um, the girls are going to leave just a little song that was sung a few weeks ago that's very appropriate. Karen's going to just a little uh, thought or reading and a, a prayer and then we have little sheets provided and the idea is just go and find a seat. In fact, even if you want to go out into the churchyard and find a seat um, and find a wee place and, and just pray for just with so many recent bereavements in church and um, serious illness in church and even just the challenge of just with somebody the other day and just the challenge of isolation and loneliness because of COVID and church itself and how we find our feet again and begin to, to build back up again. And so it's a time, I say, there is no pressure put on anybody to have to pray out loud. Um, and also, please, you're completely free to go home, <laughs> so please. Um, but if you wish, just to wait and for 15 minutes or so, just to be back in the building and then pray together or as I say, if you wish to go out even into the, to the yard, into the churchyard, and just to find a quiet personal space to pray. And then maybe just also, if anybody wants somebody to pray with them, there will be a few of us, a few folk just available, and just to pray with you if you want somebody to actually pray with you. And so please just, I say, with no pressure on anybody to be having to pray out loud, because I know that can be a scary thing. We gather to worship God, and the girls have been singing over just a wonderful song, hymn, called Yet Not I, But Christ in Me, But Through Christ in Me. Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1 about the mystery. He speaks uh, that the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Do you ever think about that? Christ 
can you the hope of glory? I know often when some people stand to sing, but can I ask you just keep your seats and let them down and hazel. We're going to lead us just in this beautiful song, Yet Not I, but Through Christ in Me. And just allow this uh, to kind of minister to you, please. Thanks. Oh.
gather to worship you this day, we ask that you would remind us afresh as to who we are in Christ. That you would encourage us, empower us, and enable us, Lord, to stand for you. Reminding us that you live within us. Remind us, Lord, of how great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. For what gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? As we are reminded of your grace, Lord, we are also reminded of our sinfulness. And so we bow again before you, Lord God, in repentance and confession, asking forgiveness for our sin, our sin in word, in thought, and in action. We thank you, Lord God, that where we are weak, you are strong. When we are feeble and fragile, you are faithful, strong, and mighty. Thank you, Lord, for your promised Holy Spirit, that deposit in our lives guaranteeing what is to come. And we pray in the words of the hymn, Lord. So, Spirit, come, put strength in every stride, give grace for every hurdle, that we may run with faith to win the prize of a servant, good and faithful. O oh, church, arise. Help us, Lord, to stand strong for you. And as we gather now as your people here, lead us in these moments together, Lord, that we may hear your voice, we may sense your spirit dwelling amongst us, and that we may enjoy fellowship one with another. So lead us, we pray, Lord, for we ask in Jesus' name. Christ 
the Messiah. Where the Paulus was in Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived again at Ephesus. Amen. So we were introduced last week to this, what we think, young man in the Paulus. But what can we learn from him as we maybe this week dig a little deeper? So we read about him with Priscilla and Aquila in Acts chapter 18 in Ephesus. But what, what more can we pick up from him from just a few verses that we have 11 times Apollos is mentioned in Scripture? Mostly in Acts 18, but also a little bit in another book. Anybody, any tapers, where that other book might be? Okay, hold that thought. What can we learn about Apollos just as we go quickly through some of these verses? We read of him a Jew named Apollos. So he was from a Jewish background. He was a Jewish boy, but did he live in Israel? No. He was a native of Alexandria. And then he came to Ephesus. So he came from Alexandria. Any tapers where Alexandria is? Good work. Mr. Table Quiz. He was a learned man. So he was intelligent. Alexandria was a, a seat of learning. It was like a Oxford or Cambridge of the time. We'll pick up on that in a minute. So he was Jewish. He was Egyptian. He was intelligent. He was a sharp man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. So being a Jewish man in the scriptures referred to here are actually what would be our Old Testament. He was thoroughly schooled and aware of all the Bible from the patriarchs right from Abraham and Moses right through and to the prophets right through the wisdom literature. He was an intelligent man who knew the Old Testament for us, the Bible for him, inside out. So that's a little bit about his person. In regards to place and native, as it says, of Alexandria, but then we read about him when he came to Ephesus, and in Acts 19 and 1, while Apollos was in Corinth, he talked about wanting to go to Achaia. And so actually, just to fill that out a little bit more, and I find that I don't know, I hope for yourselves, the map maybe helps a little bit, and sorry to those in video that you can't see it. But Alexandria in Egypt. And Alexandria was, if you like, the equivalent of an Oxford or Cambridge. It was a seat of learning. And it was a very famous lighthouse, this massive, huge lighthouse in Alexandria. But more than that, there was one of the biggest libraries in the world. That actually, I think, when the seven wonders of the world were redrafted, the library in Alexandria was one of the seven wonders. It was a seat of learning, and actually, the the Jewish philosopher called Philo. Now, I don't know; I didn't look at looking close enough to see if philosophy came from Philo, philosophy. Uh, Alistair, you could maybe fill me in on that one, <laughs> but. An absolute seat of learning, a place of high regard was Alexandria. And this is where this young man was brought up. And so all the influences of learning and education and class in Alexandria were part of Paulus's background. But we read of him coming from Alexandria to Ephesus. And then we read of him from Ephesus and this is interesting as well, not just to Corinth, but he wanted to go to the region of Achaia to talk about Jesus. So the whole, from that little ethnos of land at the bottom of Greece, it's like a separate little bit with just one wee part of land joining it to mainland Greece. He wanted to go to that whole region to talk about Jesus and share the good news of Jesus. So the person, Jewish, Egyptian, intelligent, biblical, we read about him from, up from Alexandria, but in Ephesus, and then going to Corinth to share the gospel. Again, before the days of easy Jeff and Ryanair, this was not easy. This took time, and it took money, and 
commitment for this young man. We read about him with his passion. We read he spoke, verse 25, with great fervor about the Lord and about the things of God. He spoke with great fervor. And it also says in Corinth, he vigorously, vigor, I can never say that word right, he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate. So we can pick up from just those descriptive words of him, vigorous and full of fervor. He had a fire burning in his belly for his faith. It wasn't something that was just intellectual head business. It burnt within him to the point of traveling so far to talk about Jesus and to share Jesus. Passion and passion for his faith. What about you and I? Do we have that? It's a great little verse in Proverbs. It says, it's not good to have zeal without knowledge. But for Apollos, he had both. He was full of zeal, yet he also had a great knowledge of the Lord. And again, as the wee explanation here, uh, that he knew, he knew so far. Remember last week, we were thinking with Priscilla and Aquila. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him into their homes and explained the way of God to him more adequately. And what that alludes to, as it tells us here, he really only knew what was called the baptism of John and the promise of the Messiah. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah, but that next step about again, knowing that the Spirit had fallen on the day of Pentecost as God sent his Spirit on the church, he, he had kind of got that far and they explained to him then about as Christ came and then Christ ascended to heaven and then promised his Spirit on the church that the Spirit of God now lives within his people. And I'm just filling in the last pieces of the jigsaw for a pause in his faith and understanding. As we thought last week, William Barclay said, he knew the great call to break from the past, repentance, but he did not yet know that great power to live in the days to come. That Christ in me what gift of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer? Yeah, that Christ comes and lives within us and lives through us by the power of his Spirit. When I worked with Evangelical Ministries, Raymond McGowan, that I worked with, talked about one of the guys in the staff team used to wear a little badge, and the badge said PBP WM. G I F W M Y. And there was a few letters missing. That was the only badge you could find on Google. And there was a few letters missing on that one. But let me. Any guesses? P B P W M G I F W M Y. Being confident of this, 
that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. You see, each one of us in church this morning are people in process. If we've come to know Jesus as Savior, we're not perfect. We don't have it all together. But like Apollos, we're people in process. And so please be patient with each other because God hasn't finished with us yet. Let's grow in grace and knowledge and love of God and extend that grace to each other. Please be patient with me for God hasn't finished with me yet. The person of Apollos, Jewish, Egyptian, intelligent, biblical, places Alexandria, Ephesus, Corinth, his passion, he spoke vigorously, full of fervor, this idea of process and growing in faith. And the last point, and this is not down to him, this was put upon him, is that there was a problem. There was a problem. And actually, you know the way sometimes we talk about, oh, if we were just like the New Testament church, it would all be sorted, well, it would be great. Well, the New Testament church, most of them were a mess. And often the letters that Paul wrote to the churches were to try and sort out the troubles. And that's what First and Second Corinthians were about. And so Paul writes at the start of First Corinthians in verse 11, Some have informed me that there are quarrels among you. So somebody wrote to Paul, and wherever else he was in his travels from Corinth, and says, oh, it's all kicking off. It's awful. And what was that? What were those problems? Well, one of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas, that's Peter. And still another, they were the holy ones, and I follow Christ. Oh, not like the other people following mere men. I follow Jesus. And they all split into factions. And Apollos, who had traveled from Ephesus, at Paul's encouragement and the church's encouragement, to encourage the believers in Corinth had ended up falling into factions with the ones that they favored most. One says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Still another, I follow Cephas. Another, I follow Christ. And the church had divided and were bickering amongst each other. Folks, can we learn from that? Two quick things about this problem. I want you to stop for a minute because look at the names. Paul, you know, the great servant of the church, the great Pharisee, um, known just as one of the, the top men. Peter, Peter walked with Jesus for three and a half years. He was one of the original disciples. The Lord called him at the Sea of Galilee on the beach, come follow me, and he left his nets. And, the apostle, he's the one who preached on the day of Pentecost and so many thousand turned to the Lord. Apollos' name is now in the premiership, if you'll forgive my human terms on it. He's ruling with the big dogs. This young fellow from Alexandria, who, let's face it, none of us maybe have known much about, is now mentioned in the same sentences as Paul and Peter. Here we're we'll looking at. How many of you were watching one book? Really? Really? Anybody? Yeah. Really? 18 year old who nearly got in to the quarter finals at Wimbledon. Right, help me again, Karen. 300 and 335 in the world as a tennis player. Young British girl, 18 years old. I can't believe you didn't. On Wimbledon, just a few weeks ago, and she got so, so far further than she ever had 
full of promise and ability and just a real quality in her game and a natural talent. But in the middle of the match, to hopefully get her into the quarterfinal, just the whole occasion. She had never played on a, a tournament uh, field or court, excuse me, like that before. And just the whole occasion and you know the whole of the UK behind her cheering her on and she choked and it took almost like a little panic attack or kind of breathless and she had to retire from the game. She's only 18 years old, she still hasn't got her A-level results. Why do I say this? She was rolling with the big dogs. She was into the Premiership. She will be now for the next years if she gets over her blip here, which I think from character and personality and interviewed with Sue Barker and everybody, she just seems really level-headed and, and she'll do well. But how many of us, well maybe from quite obvious, nobody really watches the home. <laughs> But when I look watching the movie, I think, well, where's Andrew Agron? Andre Agassi and Pete Sampras. They're the names I remember. Who are all these new people? And all these new people have come in and they're fantastic. Or if you're watching the golf, thinking, I don't know any. In fact, Karen and the British Lions were on yesterday says, I only know a thing one of them. And as new people come and come to the fellowship and come with gifts and abilities. And as Apollos came, Priscilla and Aquila didn't get jealous of him. They encouraged him, let's come into the house. Let's sit down, let's talk heart to heart, let's grow in faith together. You know, you, know, you get over to Corinth and help the church there. I mean, that was Paul's encouragement. And so that whole idea of encouraging those who come in, the challenge for the younger ones developing their faith and expressing their gifts and growing is as Paul writes to Timothy you know what, don't let anybody look down on you because you're young and we could just stop there but Paul doesn't he says no, don't let anybody look down to you because of your youth but set an example for the believers in your speech in life, in love in faith and in purity are we going to be people that encourage and for those coming in, maybe to the fellowship new, again, set an example. Live, can I, live well for the Lord in that space. Paul, rather than getting jealous here, he talks about partnership. He talks about partnership in the gospel. Let me read for you just what Paul writes within this whole context. What after all, he writes in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 5, what after all is Apollos? What is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. But God made it grow, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. You pick that up. As the Lord has assigned to each their task, can I ask you this morning in Ryan Church, are you playing your part as the Lord has assigned to each their task? See, because Paul, well, he planted the seed. Apollos, his job was to water it. But working in partnership with God that makes it grow. And then the other spaces and places where we read about about Apollos in 1 Corinthians 16, 12, Paul writes now about our brother, Apollos. He doesn't write now about this fella, Apollos, or about this young upstart, Apollos. He writes about our brother, Apollos, because we are the family of faith. 
And the other place, other than Corinthians and Acts, where we read about Paulus, is as he writes to Timothy or to Titus. And he says to Titus, do everything you can to help Zenos and Apollos on their way and see that they have everything they need. And again, just that challenge, folks, about the family of faith and us all playing our part in expressing our gifts and using our gifts. And the challenge is for us, are we doing that? Both encouraging and exercising our gifts and encouraging others in that. Two things to finish. And again, I'm thinking, please be patient with me because God hasn't finished with me yet. We all express and ex expound grace to each other. But have you a passion for sharing the gospel? This young man, Apollos, did. And he travelled the Mediterranean basin to do that. It says in Acts 18 and 26, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue to talk to the Jews that didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah. He wanted to share with them and further a passion for sharing the gospel. But more than that, a passion also for spiritual growth. And Dr. Luke writes in Acts 18 and 27, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. He was a great help. So for you this morning, if you love the Lord, do you have a passion for sharing the gospel wherever he's placed you? And do you have a passion for spiritual growth? Karen and I bumped into a friend yesterday. John's just moved as Methodist minister from Donegal Town Circuit up into Moville and taken on a, a whole area there. And he says, oh, Gordy, Karen, I just, I just want to tell people about Jesus and I just want to encourage people to come to know Jesus and then encourage people to come to know Jesus more and to grow in him. And it was funny, he didn't know, but standing in the car park, the two of us, the three of us gasping for a wee minute. That was the last two points I'd already written in preparation for this morning. He says, I want to tell people about Jesus and I want to help people grow more in Jesus. And maybe even this morning, folks, for you, maybe actually you're in that place where you still need to come to know Jesus. Or maybe you're in that place where you have made a commitment to Jesus maybe many years ago when things have gone stale and you need just a little zip to, to grow and to, again, let me encourage the wee book, love your church, and, you know, but not that it has all the answers, but that commitment of heart to jump in. And again, I've banged on about it for a few weeks, but this big lump of a building across the car park will be a white elephant if it is not filled with God's people in it to serve and to share and to help develop and run programs in it, to talk about Jesus and share the gospel and then to those who know Jesus to be in the building helping and uh, discipleship to grow in Jesus with our boys and girls or young people and ourselves or adults. Passion to share the gospel and a passion for spiritual growth, may that live strong within us. And so the challenge and the encouragement this morning is are we going to hear the call of the kingdom to reach out to the lost and that the king of heaven will flow through us and the spirit will flow through us as we speak for him and share the good news. We're going to worship God in a song just to help us respond and uh, just so that you've probably guessed to hear the call of the kingdom. This is what we want to do.
pray together for a moment and then as I'll say the benediction and if you feel you need to slip on we'll just take a wee five or ten minute break just let us get a wee fresh air and then for those who wish to gather just for a short personal prayer time uh, we will do that but we pray together Lord God we ask again this day that you would help us to learn from the life witness of another one of your lesser known faithful followers. Like Apollos, Lord, give us a passion to share the gospel with a world that is lost without you. Give us a passion for growth in faith, Lord, for those who have come to know you as Saviour and Lord. And maybe, Lord, today we need that passion ignited again in our own lives as we can so easily lose our first love. Our love for you, Lord, our desire to serve you. So please, Lord, reawaken and reignite our faith that we may grow to love you more, to know you more, to serve you more. Allow us also, Lord, to see how we can commit to the family of faith here in our church, especially as we seek to find our feet as a gathered fellowship, after all the restrictions and the isolation that we've experienced for so long in this last while. We ask, Lord God, that you would lead the eldership here in church in decisions and discussions as we begin to consider, to consider things for September and beyond as to how we can begin to restart programs and fellowship groups. We ask again, Lord, just with so much uncertainty at present, that you will lead us and guide us and give us your wisdom, we pray. As we draw this time of worship to a close, we ask that the grace of Christ may attend us, that the love of God may surround us, and that the peace presence of the Holy Spirit may keep us both now and forevermore.